Okay, uh, we're beginning the session. My name is Doug Fairbairn. I'm conducting an oral history with uh, Lee Lau and Benny Lau, uh, two of the, I believe, three primary founders of a uh, company that's variously been known as Array Technology, Array Technologies, ATI Technologies, and uh, perhaps other names along the way. Uh, just for uh, clarification, uh, Benny and Lee, although they share a uh, common last name are not uh, related. Uh, and we're delighted to have you here. It's uh, July 13th, 2021, and we're recording this uh, oral history uh, for the benefit of the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. So welcome, delighted to uh, have you both with us and look forward to an interesting conversation. Um, so the first thing I'd like to do is uh, sort of ask each of you to spend a little time giving uh, a little prelude background uh, on your own individual, uh, on your personal history, and to learn when and where you were born, what kind of environment you grew up in, what kind of educational environment, what brought you to Canada, uh, where you uh, co-founded the company, and how you met. And uh, at that point, uh, we'll sort of switch to the other one and do the similar story. And then we'll get into more of a uh, back and forth uh, in terms of the actual history of the, of the company itself. So uh, Lee, let's just start with you. Uh, can you give me some of your personal background, when and where you were born, some of your early uh, remembrances, in people who influenced your life and uh, how you found yourself uh, in Canada? Good. Well, thank you for for interview for the interview. I'm really honored uh, to be part of the uh, Computer Museum. Um, I'm uh, born in Hong Kong. Born and grew up in Hong Kong. Um, I was a really poor student when I was young. Uh, kind of a really good pop. Didn't learn anything until I come to Canada. <laughs> so when I come to Canada, but normally when people think that, oh, this Chinese kid from Hong Kong, he must be really smart in uh, math, uh, physics and stuff like that. But I was the opposite. I'm a blank sheet of paper. I learned everything in Canada. Uh, down to the basic math, algebra, and everything. Uh, Tell me about your family. What? Uh, how did you grow up? Uh, what kind of? Uh, what was it like growing up in uh, Hong Kong and so forth? My family is so. I come from a really big family. I have uh, five brothers and sisters, and my parents. But as with most uh, parents in those days in Hong Kong relatively poor, but poor, but happy, right? Uh, they financially, they kind of improve every year. Every year they get better, every year we get better. And my father is in a textile business. Uh, he has a factory to make denim the material for jeans and he worked. Uh, I hardly get to see him, both my father and my mother. They were out before I wake up and when they come back, I was already sleeping. So basically I was, uh, we grew up, we grew up looking after ourselves. Were you an older child and helping take care of the younger ones or vice versa? No, I'm the lucky one. I'm the youngest and uh, I don't look after anyone. <laughs> I don't have to look after anyone. Uh, there's a big age gap between me and my, my uh, the second eldest brother. Right? So uh, we hardly, but when I was young, they were away to U.S. to study, uh, to U.S. and to Toronto to study. 
when they come back, I, I left. So we kind of, uh, we don't meet each other that much. So was, uh, was education important? You said you were screwing off. Did your parents uh, try to get you to study harder or what? Uh, oh yeah, all the time, all the time. So it was uh, very difficult every, every time I have to give them, show them the report card because it was all red. Uh, at that time when you fail, it's red. They, they write the number in red. <laughs> the, the thing is, I don't know, as a kid, I don't like to study. I don't like to do anything. The only thing I want to do is to play and just watch TV. And I think the biggest change, what caused the change is, uh, so I was already doomed because my father is already planning when I was around 15, uh, form four, which is high school, my father already know that I'm not going to make it into any high edu, any u university in Hong Kong. So he's already planning to send me to uh, Toronto to be with my eldest brother so that I can somehow go to university in Toronto. Uh, so before that, we went on a trip. He took me on a trip to uh, Toronto to visit my brother. And I was supposed to be the interpreter because he thought that I've been studying English lesson all this year, so I must know English. But that's on that trip, that's when I find out that I don't know any. That I don't know, I don't know what people are talking about, all the signs in the airport, I don't understand. So that's that's where that's when I realized that oh shit, I mean I'm in trouble. So when I come back from Toronto, I started really learning English. Uh, so I, my plan is to learn ten words a day, every day. So my time was consumed with remembering words. So I would pick up a. Newsweek magazine to read through the sentences and almost every other word I have to look at the dictionary. At that time, there's no Google, right? So you, you have to carry around a dictionary. So six months to nine months later, I think I don't remember exactly how long, I was able to read through a Newsweek article. So did you also become more serious about your other studies at that time? Oh yeah, big time, big time. So roughly around the same time, I got really interested in, well, how does radio work? How does uh, TV work? Uh, how does, uh, how does uh, telephone work? So, and so that, that is what, what started me to, uh, what makes me want to uh, study engineering when I come to Toronto. So when I come to, when I arrived in Canada, I went to a high school near where my brother lived, uh, Lawrence Park Collegiate. And that's where I learned, within one year, I catch up, it's really hard work. Uh, Basically, I have no social life. Seven days a week, from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed, I'll be studying math, algebra, calculus, function and relation, physics, uh, algebra, biology, and stuff like that. So for some reason, I was really focused on studying. What grade did you enter in high school? Did is it just your senior year, or had you you started a younger? Uh, so I think I came to Canada around sixteen, and the first grade I went to is a uh, grade twelve. At that time, there's still grade thirteen, but grade twelve turns out to be way more difficult than grade thirteen because grade twelve I have to. Like math and algebra and calculus, I can catch up because it's just numbers. Uh, but in grade 12, I also have to study geography, 
history, English, and it turns out to be really difficult, right? Uh, so, so the principal with my brother talked with the principal, so we decided to okay, maybe it's easier if we go straight to grade 13, where I can only study uh, function and relation, algebra, calculus, physics, and biology. So all science subject. So that worked. <laughs> and I, I got pretty good mark and I was accepted into uh, U of T engineering. So how you said you came to Toronto because your elder brother was there. Why had your brother gone there? What was the connection to Toronto? My brother came here to study as well. He, uh, he, he studied pharmacy. And after he, he got his pharmacy degree and then he studied medicine. So when I came here, he was, uh, he, he was interning as a doctor. Okay. Do you know why he went to Toronto rather than some other location? I, I'm not sure. I think probably because uh, the popular choices at that time is uh, U.S. and uh, Toronto. I think somehow he picked it. Somehow he picked Toronto. Was there a Was there a large Chinese community in Toronto? Not at that time. There's uh, still a lot of Chinese, but not like today's where, where there are a lot of Chinese. But at that time, there's a number of Chinese, but not as much as today. Okay. Uh, going back to the beginning, we didn't get... What year were you born? Uh, 1956. Okay. May. Okay. May 16th, yeah. Just want to get that information down. So you went to University of Toronto, you went to the engineering school and yeah. did you, you immediately were drawn to electrical engineering. Is that what you're uh, telling us? Yes, yes. So I was uh, really attracted to electrical engineering. And I became a really good student at U of T, top student. And what was your, what kind of interest did you develop there? Any specific area? Did you learn more about computers? Uh, was there a professor that particularly interested you or acted as a mentor? Tell us a little bit about your university education. I think it's, it's kind of like uh, my uh, best, best educational time in my life. Uh, learn a lot. At that time, I think the year that I started, they just stopped teaching vacuum tube. And computer uh, is not like today, right? Where everywhere is computer at that time. Uh, they're using computer mainframe. And hard drive is something, is a luxury. Uh, so, so I didn't really learn much about computers. So we mainly learned basic electronic principle, circuit theory, uh, transistor operational amplifier, uh, filters, analog filters and stuff like that. Um, and I still remember the second year Engineering is the first time they they allow the use of a electronic scientific calculator and stop using slide rule. The first year we're still using slide rules. <laughs> so, what degree did you graduate with? Did you get a bachelor's or a master's, or what was your? Uh, I got a bachelor degree of applied science, mm -hmm. and then I went on to. Saying also U of T, uh, Master of Engineering. And did you write a thesis or do have any special studies as part of your master's degree? My master degree was in uh, was in uh, was in what was it in filter? At that time, you still. Uh, 
we still have an analog filter capacitor inductor and stuff like that. So my my my, my degree was in uh, making filter better or something like that. I forgot what it is. Right. So you had a lot of circuit theory and and building things from individual components. Oh yeah. So yeah, I, I still remember at that time I was fascinated by Fourier transform. It turns out that everything, all the signal processing is based on a really simple theory, right? Bandwidth, uh, uh, how you transmit, uh, how you transmit uh, a radio signal, how to modulate when you modulate. So a lot of things is based on some really basic fundamental principle. It was uh, fascinated at that time. And even when I graduated, we were still using punch card. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still remember at that time, I, I, I'm one of uh, those people that you would call nerd. So a lot of students when after school, they would go to, uh, they would go to watch a uh, hockey or baseball or whatever. And me and a few, we have about a group of about five, five, uh, five classmates. That, so instead of going to watch hockey, we would be, uh, we'll go back to, to someone's apartment and start building uh, a timer, or a frequency counter, a frequency generator, and stuff like that. Or we would buy, uh, at that time, there's, uh, uh, S100 bus uh, computer, right? With a paddle switch at the front. So we'll, we'll be building computer, uh, toggling in, uh, in a program by all these little switches. And, uh, and that would be our hobby, uh, our entertainment. So once you come, what, what year did you complete your master's degree? 19... 1980. 1980. I think. Yeah, 1977. And I got my bachelor. And 1980, my master. And uh, then you went to work. Where did you go to work, or what was the next step? I went to work for for a company. It's a division of Motorola. It's called Plessy. Plessy. Uh, P L E S S E Y Plessy. I forgot what's I forgot what's after that, but they make uh, telephone equipment, modem, and stuff like that. And after that, I worked for Mitel. Oh, actually, before Plessy, I worked for a little startup that make uh, communication equipment and stuff like that. And then I went to, and then I went to actually. A little style up, and then I went to Mytel. But I live in Toronto. Mytel is in Ottawa. The driving back and forth uh, is too much for me. So I, I come back to Toronto and work for Plessy. After Plessy, I started, started uh, Camway, which is a precursor to ATI. Where did you meet Benny? Benny is. Uh, so I saw the Camway and, uh, and we designed some graphics card and, it is manu and we had it manufactured by a contractor in Hong Kong. So he said the, he said the subcontractor where I met KY, which everybody knows is the president of uh, ATI. And then KY introduced us to Benny and Benny is our first real full-time designer, design engineer. Okay, well, let's, uh, we'll pick that up in a little bit. Why don't we switch over to Benny, uh, Benny Lau. Uh, can we uh, tell us a little bit about your upbringing, where you were born, when you were born, uh, what your family life was like and how you found your way to Toronto? Well, I was born in, uh... 1956, also May. <laughs> uh, Lee is one week older than me. <laughs> so I was born in a family with five children. 
and uh, we were extremely poor in those times in Hong Kong. Right? So you were born in Hong Kong on, within a few days of, uh, of your friend here, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, my father, like my father was from a rich family, but then he, my grandfather died when he was about, when he was in his teenager. So he has to quit school and go out and start working. And uh, so, so he started a family and then with five children. So we were very poor in those days. And, uh, and he worked very hard and eventually he started his own company and, and kind of worked his way up. So that gave me a lot of inspiration. Like I, I, I always telling myself that I, I want to do something myself too when I grow up. And uh, I finished my high school form four, it was also similar to Lee. And, uh, and my father, my father's friend sent this kids to Toronto and my father thought oh, maybe it's a good idea so he uh, he decided to uh, send me over to Toronto as well. So now I were you in what were your interests in growing up and were you a better student than Lee was uh, in in Hong Kong? I think I was. <laughs> I'd uh at least I'm not a blank sheet of paper. <laughs> <laughs> I came here and I studied grade 12 and grade 13. And I was the valedictorian, valedictorian of the school uh, when we graduated. But so, you, you went to a different school than uh, well, different school, I went to a school in Niagara Falls, which is about one and a half hour drive from Toronto. Uh -huh. And... Uh, but I came here as a foreign student. Now, were you interested in science and electronics and math before you came to Canada? Uh, actually, I, I always wanted to study medicine. Oh. And, uh, but unfortunately, unfortunately, when I came at that, in those days, I came as a foreign student and, and Canada kind of not they put a restriction not allowing foreign students to study medicine. So I, I, I ended up studying electrical engineering because in those days they still accept only about 10% of the applicant for, the, for foreign students. So I got in the U of T electrical engineering program. And had you been building any electronic projects or anything like that before uh, getting to engineering school? No, not really. Like I said before, I wasn't really, <laughs> really interested in, in engineering or circuitry or whatever. <laughs> so I, and I know I, I, I'm lacking that kind of experience. So when I was in the third year, the summer, I. Like because as a foreign student, I cannot work or find some job. So, okay. so I so third year I went to the uh, engineering department and talked to the professor, uh, Professor Cousin. I said, "Can I work for you for free? I just want to learn how to like build a circuit board and build a counter or build whatever project you have in mind. I can." work for you for free. So he hired me. And so uh, that's how I get the actually like physical experience of touching a transistor, touching a resistor and things like that. At, at what point did you, decide, did you decide that engineering was really worth pursuing as opposed to really still wanting to pursue medicine? Well, um, like when I, after I finished my uh, bachelor degree in applied science, the engineering degree, I, I, my master degree is, is actually a division of the electrical engineering, which is the biomedical engineering. 
So it's kind of same, like have some kind of a favor in 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 bio, biology or medicine. So so that's why I selected that as my master as the field of study for my master degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, my thesis uh, for my master degree was in uh, using ultrasound to to diagnose atherosclerosis, which is like the narrowing of the the, the vessels, the blood vessels. Mm -hmm. Using ultrasound to basically to measure the speed of the red blood cells moving through the vessels, and based on the Doppler effect and develop a display a profile of the uh, of the red blood cell going through the vessel and then from that profile you can kind of diagnose whether there is a narrowing or hardening of the artery so so that's for the and then that system was used by the uh, the doctor in the Toronto General Hospital yeah that sounds like a pretty uh, pretty important useful diagnosis yeah, so um, so I got my master's degree uh, two years from so after so like I graduated in 1979 with my bachelor, and then 1981 with my master's degree. And uh, and then you went off. To, did did you ever think about going back to Hong Kong, or you always assumed you would stay in Canada? Well, actually, uh, I was thinking of going back to Hong Kong. And uh, like after my my study, and uh, and then I met my wife, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then I decided to stay. Uh, she was the she was immig she immigrate to Toronto from Hong Kong as well, uh -huh. and so her family is here, and so I decided to apply for the permanent residence and, and stay. And so then you, what was your first job there in Canada? My first job was working for a military company called Litton Industries. Mm -hmm. And uh, like they, uh, it, as a circuitry designer for, the, for them. And then like they were doing this system that anti-aircraft missile system and the sound, the, 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 the topic seems to be very, very interesting, but when I actually work, just working on one little circuitry. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they give you, uh, they give you a uh, three weeks to do a project that realistically you only take one day to finish. So the rest of the three weeks, I was just counting my fingers. <laughs> So I got bored. So I got bored. So after a few months, I said I can't stand it. It's just too boring. So I quit, and I went to a company called Anticom, uh, which at that time they were acquired by a bigger company called no, uh, Napu, which they um, developed. They were ahead of their time. They were actually develop, developing a terminal end, like it's a computer uh, that hook up to a the, the cable through a cable modem. So the idea was that there, there, there wasn't any internet at the time. So they were, they had this idea of, of oh, how about like the, the, the head end of the cable company, they store all the news and stocks, quotes and games that people, if you buy this terminal, hook up to your cable and you can download this game news and whatever, and then you can, you can play with it and use it. So I developed that terminal for them. And hmm. what was the name of the company and what was the company that got, that did the acquisition? Well, the, the company that did the, I believe is, uh, NABU, N-A-B-U. Okay. And like they are, they basically almost like a shell company. They acquire a lot of, let's like say 
they acquired a company in Ottawa that specialized in making cable modem. And Anticom is specialized in make designing computers. Mm -hmm. So they acquire all this company with expertise in different pieces and they, they, they put them into, together to, uh, to, provide, to provide such a service. But the problem with the company at the time was uh, they, they spend money as quickly as they, they raise the money. Uh, the company, the little company has about 40 something vice presidents. I don't know why. <laughs> when they go to a convention in Toronto, they send 40 VPs. You know, so they're burning money like crazy. So, so uh, at that time, uh, my, my, like my manager and some of the people at Anticom, they decided to quit and start another company uh, called Semitech. And this, the, the founder of Semitech, one of the founder of Semitech is, happened to be Lee's, Lee's uh, university classmate called James Ting. And so I, I, so I worked there as a, also a design engineer. We designed the first, I believe that was the first uh, transportable computer in those days. So you can, uh, you can carry the computer like, like a laptop, but it's, a, well, but it's more heavier than a laptop in those days. What, what year was that? Oh, that was 1980. 83, I think. Mm -hmm. What processor was it based on? It was based on uh, uh, Intel 8088 or mm -hmm. 86. Uh, and, and like Semitech is kind of a, a, a point that like, like where the, where we met KY and Lee. So because uh, like I said earlier, James Ting, who is the uh, one of the founder of Semitech, also know KY Ho from Hong Kong. So at that, at that time, KY decided to immigrate to Canada. So James asked KY to do some business pro like proposal for him. So 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 sometimes KY will come to Semitech office, and so I so that's how I know KY. And like Lee mentioned at that time, Lee has his company called Conway making graphics card, but sometimes Lee will come to visit uh, Semitech as well because he also know James. And so I met, I met Lee while I was working there as well. So that's how three of us met from Semitech. So how did uh, how did the idea for well what year did you first meet and how long was it then before you actually decided to uh, go off and start a company? I think we met in uh, 1983, 83 Lee. Yeah. So okay, around that time. Yeah. yeah so uh, and then Lee like lately has a calm way at running at the time. So Lee basically asked KY and myself to, to join him at the time. And, uh, and, uh, and like Lee suggests that maybe we incorporate a new company and uh, start it from scratch. So Lee, what, what was your motivation? What were you doing at the time exactly? And why did you think it was the best thing to start a new company? Were you frustrated what you were doing or you thought there was an opportunity? Tell me about that. I think it's uh, all of the above. But it's funny that I knew Benny for so long. This is the first time I heard about his uh, family, his background, <laughs> uh, uh, what he was doing in Hong Kong. 
he was even uh, uh, his high school. His friend, and also the uh, Professor Kassam. I also worked with him as a research assistant. So uh, I learned a lot from him, from building circuit, debugging circuit, and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's funny that two separate individuals just our path crosses without knowing so many times. And with so, so much similarity in terms of when and size of family and when yeah. you were born and uh, it's remarkable, uh, the similarities. And did, did you discover this immediately or did you just discover it over time that there was this similarity between your backgrounds? Yeah, I think where, where we actually, where after we met and we worked together, we were so busy. We never really talk about okay where where we come from what what did we do before because right. I mean we were we were actually we we're so busy that we we got up in the morning and go straight to work and when we come home at night we're so tired and just you know, just just go to sleep uh, but but kind of the precursor to ATI was calm way. Uh, we made some graphics card, memory card, uh, mostly copycat, no, nothing, nothing special. We had a little bit of feature like graphics card with parallel port and serial port. Uh, these were all for, we these were all for like IBM PC compatible machines. Yeah, yeah. So at that time, the, the biggest company is AST in California. So everybody knows them. They, they sell graphics card, memory card, anything that plugs into the IBM PC, they, they make it. So we, we have, so, so, so we try to, try to, okay, let me go back a little bit. So now, so I finally mentioned James Tang. Right? James Tang, we, we were in the same class uh, since uh, undergraduate school, all four years and, and graduate school. Same same supervisor. Uh, James Tang is one of the nerds that, that, that we, we don't watch hockey game, where right? we go and build stuff after school. Uh, he's also extremely resourceful, super good at writing proposal. Uh, and he's also very entrepreneurial. So Andy Com. So actually before Com, we Andy Com uh, was started by James Stan me and a couple other U of, two, U of T student. Uh, I left Andycom after two years because uh, at that time, but when we first started, our agreement was okay. Five founders, each one has uh, 20%. So that, that's the engineering mindset, right? So we don't, uh, and then the, after after a while, James was, was saying, "Okay, that's that's not." I think he said that uh, everyone equal share is not that fair because uh, I contribute a lot more. I find other contracts. We were just designing, uh, so I want more shares. Uh, you guys, uh, so uh, thinking back. I, He's right. I mean, we have like four engineers designing stuff, and it's one. It's the only one raising money and uh, finding contracts. But at that time, I was like, "Oh, no way!" I mean, we we said we're all equal shareholder, and uh, I don't want to give up any, so I left. <laughs> so Andy Com went on to become Napu, and then Semitech, right? Semitech, and he's. Uh, 
Kendra is an extremely resourceful guy. Uh, and, and it kind of inspired me to start Conway. The, the funny story was uh, before, at the time I started Conway, before I started Conway. So after a, while, after a long time after Anticom, uh, we, we never really talk again, but one day I received a, a phone call, an email from James. I, I forgot whether it's an email or phone call. And then he said, Lee, come and, come and, come and check out my, my new company, Samitap. We have a huge building in uh, uh, Highway 7 and, and Warden. And we're doing really interesting stuff, uh, personal computer and, and stuff like that. So I went and see him and then I saw that building, right? And wow, well, this is my building. Well, this is my mainframe room. And uh, if you come and work for me, you have your own secretary in your office. So that inspired me. <clears throat> so at that time I was working for, for this Toronto, for, for this uh, uh, motor roller can, Toronto company. And then, and then, and then, and then uh, when, I, when I went home, I was think, thinking about it. Wow, that was really interesting. That was great. But, but I think I can do it too. So, and then one week later, one week later, I quit my job without even any planning. I have no capital. I don't know anything about financing, starting company, anything. But it was, it was just, just stupid. So after I quit my job, when I was driving home, I was crying. <laughs> oh, shit, what do I do tomorrow? No place to go to. But I already quit my job, so that's, that's how I ended up. That's how comedy got started. So, so and then we jump to ATI, right? So I think uh, Conway, so in the beginning, it was just uh, me, me and my father at that time already doing quite well. So he has a small office building in Toronto, renting out little offices. So, so my father gave me a tiny little office as 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 the uh, as my first office, uh, and but it wasn't doing well. And there was another shareholder, which is uh, James Ting brother, Alan Ting. Alan Ting is also a really good. I mean, he's a really smart guy. Somehow he runs in the family. He's also an extremely good writer and a good salesman. But then his idea is marketing, right? You, you, you always say coca cola and sell sugar water. So marketing is everything. Uh, but I kind of disagree. I think that you know, with my engineering background, I think product is everything. Uh, marketing would help if you have a good product. And uh, Coca-Cola actually is a very good product, not just sugar water. <clears throat> So we disagreed. So we split up, and at that time, uh, there's also KY and Danny. So, so we started a new company. He, 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 I think Alan Tang doesn't want to join. He, he went his own way. That's how ATI got started. Now, did uh, had KY done anything like this before? Was he? Was it hard to convince uh, KY and Benny to go off and do this? Uh... Mm, not that. I think KY came as a permanent resident. So he, he was, uh, I think he's a general manager with a very big electronics subcontractor in, in Hong Kong. Uh, so he is looking for opportunity. Uh, <laughs> It so seems many. like he, before he even joined formally, right? He's already working. We were already working. We go out. He also staying at my home at that time because he hasn't find a place yet. So we, we, go, we go out seven in the morning, come home midnight. And we were doing that day in and day out. So 
from Conway to ATI is just a name change, <laughs> practically. So and Benny, I think he's, he's also, I think, I don't remember exactly, but I think Benny is also like, he's already married, so he doesn't, we don't live together, but, but he's also working, working like, from sunrise to, uh, to midnight. So Benny, tell me uh, your side of the story. Did uh, did you did they have to convince you to join this uh, new opera new company? And did you quit, or did you try to do both at the same time? And you were married, so did you worry about a paycheck? Well, not at all. I, I mean, I uh, just uh, just say yes right away. <laughs> but, uh, like I said earlier, I like I mean. I always wanted to, while I was young and I can afford to lose, if it doesn't work out, I can always go back and find a job. So that's why, I, I mean, I always wanted to do something instead of uh, like working for somebody. Like, yeah, so it's always what I'm been looking for. So I, at that time I, like my experience was I designed the, uh, the computers, the terminal and computer for the, for Anticom. And then I was designing a lot of different part of a computer in, when I was in Semitech for the computer, uh, for the transportable computer. So I'm pretty experienced uh, at that time for designing graphics and computer circuitry. So, so I, I, I don't worry about not able to, to do the job. So, so when the opportunity comes, uh, I mean, I would just jump in. So how did you all decide what product to develop? What was your first? Uh... Um, should I answer that? Yeah, go ahead. I will get both answers, see if they're the same. Okay. Uh, should we get Lee out of the room? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like we are, like in it, we are just continuing of what Lee has been doing with Conway. But we we saw an opportunity in the sense that, as Lee mentioned earlier, that what Conway did was like basically a kind of a clone of the IBM graphics card. Like the IBM at the time, as a color adapter, which only display color, but the resolution color, uh, like graphics and text, but the resolution is really low. Like for the color part is 320 by 200 resolution. And for the graphics part is 640 by 200, which is really low. And then they have another card, uh, which is, can display monochrome which is higher resolution, like 720 by 348 resolution. But so for someone who purchased an IBM computer, so they have to make a decision that when they're buying the computer, whether I want color, but with lower resolution or a monochrome with higher resolutions. And then there is, so another third party graphics adapter called Plantronics saying that, oh, okay, the IBM color card only can display four colors. So the Plantronic card can display, they modify so that they can display 16 colors. So, so it's kind of like the cards are kind of segmented by the features. So the user has to decide from the beginning what they want and buy what card. So we kind of see an opportunity. Why don't we combine all this into one card and and then the user don't have to make that choice. Uh, so they can buy this one graphics card plugin and it doesn't matter what they want, they can always use the same card. So we saw that, oh, this is a, this would be a good product. But then uh, when we look at it, so, oh, if you put all this feature into one, at that time we're still using but the, the, the graphics card still using those discrete device called TTL, like discrete chips. Mm -hmm. And so to put all these features into one graphics card, which is limited by the form factor of how big you can plug into the ISA slots, 
to the computer. So that might require a lot of chips, a lot of discrete chips. So, so at the time, it happens that at the time, the, the gay array technology become starting to become, I mean, popular. And uh, then I believe Lee suggests, why don't we use the gay array technology and put all these discrete logics into one chip? And, and uh, so we say, oh, that's a good idea. And, and I use this gay array technology at that time, there is a company in California, which is offering this technology. This, this device called uh, CDI, the company called CDI California. California devices. Yeah, California devices. And so we use the gay array technology. And then at that time we were trying to also figure out what to name what to name the company. And then like from marketing point of view, we always wanted to start from the letter A because then they you get you get there first on the list. So and then we we say how about call array technologies inc. As you mentioned earlier, right? The array technologies inc. So so then uh, when we start to market the product on like PC Week and PC Magazines and, and then very quickly we receive a legal letter from another company called Array, Te Technology, Array Technologies Inc. from California. Okay. So, and so, oh, you can't be, you, you can't use this name, it's very confusing. So, so then uh, KY at that time suggests how about we just take the first letter from Array Technologies Inc. and call ATI Technologies Inc. So that will be the least kind of interruption to the ex to the marketing for sure already going out at that time. So that's how we got the name. <laughs> so Lee, is that, uh, does that correspond with your memory of how things developed? Yeah, pretty accurate. Uh, I, I, I want to just add that uh, uh, the inspiration of uh, using gate arrays was actually uh, came from another company. So at that time, I uh, was always paranoid about competition. So I was always looking at PC Magazine, PC World. And one day I was scanning the magazine and then this, this ad from a company called Hercules. Hercules used to be just making regular like, uh, graphics card, monochrome card, color card using discrete logic chips. And then one day I saw this ad from them showing a half card. So one gate array and a CRT controller and some RAM and crystal, that's it. Wow, shit, I mean, really sexy. So then I talked to Benny, right? So, so at that time, we were always eat lunch and dinner together. So, so over dinner or, or lunch or dinner, I don't remember, and then we're talking, well, how about we use Kate Array? And then Brandon, oh yeah. So that, that's how we, we got our, our first uh, home run product, decided on our first home run product. And there's a funny story to uh, CDI, California Device Inc. for Gate Array. So that's the that's not our first choice. Uh, uh, obviously, when, when you want to do a Gate Array, you, you look up magazine and you find the bigger player, right? So, uh, so the company that I called was uh, uh, LSI Logic. And also calls CDI, right, as a backup a smaller company. So a salesman from LS, LSI Logic show up one day. At that time, we have a tiny little office. At the back is warehouse, and there's a small little office in front. And this salesman come in, I, I already see his look in his eye. He's looking around, what, I mean, where, where is this place? I mean, why am I here? So I introduce ourselves and, and then sit down with him and say, okay, uh, we have this product and we want to do uh, into gate array 
and they asked me about volume. We, at that time, we were thinking, okay, maybe uh, 10,000 chip a year or a month. I don't remember what I call him. And then after a little while, he said he wanted to go to the washroom. So I showed him where the washroom is, and I waited in the, in the meeting room, and then he never came back. So it turns out that he left <laughs> without saying goodbye. <laughs> Can you believe that? I mean, you don't even have the courtesy to say, oh, okay, I think, I think you're too small for us. So he just left. <laughs> so, but the seat, the California device salesman, he was selling me. He come here, he was showing me all this big plot, right? Oh, this is how we route chip. I mean, we, we can really pack the chip in and stuff like that. So, so I think it ended up being a really beneficial business relationship, right? <laughs> 10,000 chip a month turns out to be 100,000 chip a month or, or, or even more. Well, that's a very interesting story. So tell me about uh, how you raise money for this. Uh, you aren't in Silicon Valley. You aren't going to venture capitalists. How did you raise money and how much did you need? Very little. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think, I think the time where you can just just uh, start a company without a lot of capital is, is over a long time ago. So at that time, it's basically from from uh, uh, how should I call it? Uh, the first money came from my uh, from my parent, right? So they didn't really give us. Uh, a lot of money, so it's, it's also from, it's mainly from the money mainly come from from people not but Ben is not paid for a long time. KY is not paid. There's also another person that was with with us from day one. I mean day minus is Arthur Lai, he's the programmer. So he has a full time job and also do programming for us. So he also, he also not being paid, and I'm not being paid. The office that we use that we that we use is for my family uh, building. So there's no no rent to be paid. To. So expense is very little, and and I think there's also Francis Lau, right, my uncle. So this is, so at the same time, at that time, he just emigrated to Canada. As a as an invest as, a, as somebody who would invest money and then he get his uh, uh, permanent residence status. So he's so he's looking for investment and I needed the money so he invested I think around two hundred thousand uh, dollars. So that's how we got our capital. So, so you, when did the, when did you form the company? What, what was the formation date? 84. Yeah, officially, I believe it's 1985. Mm -hmm. okay. And had you been, had you been working on the product and so forth before then? Yeah. Probably about six months to nine, nine months before then. I so see. when, when API was formed, we were about half a year from a from a real product. Is that right, Penny? Uh, uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah. So half a year after we formed, we we are ready to ship the first graphics card. In doing some research, it mentioned that you worked with the Microelectronics Development Center at the U of T uh, to assist in the chip design. Is yeah. that? Tell me a little bit about that. You want to do it? Or are you... I, I, can, I can talk. Yep. So I think uh, actually, actually it is also one of the reasons why our overhead is so low at that time is because like, I mean, when we, when we do a design with CDI, we don't have money to purchase a workstations or all the, all the CAD software. And we're just a small startup at the time. So we found that this uh, microelectronic division uh, in, from the University of Toronto, which is funded by the, uh, 
the Canadian government. So they provide this service for small company company like us that like they will allow us to use their workstations to design to convert our logic design into the 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 whatever necessary for CDI to take that file to to make the chip for us. So they already have the workstation, the CAD software, and actually also the, the people that provide the expertise uh, to do that conversion. So that's that's why our overhead can be so low uh, as well at the time. And that was part of the University of Toronto also, is that correct? Yeah, they are, they are under the University of Toronto umbrella. And did you have any other cooperation or get students or whatever from the uh, university? Well, no, well, it's interesting. Uh, I, I, I designed the circuitry. So I, I spent quite a lot of time working at the Microelectron Center to, to do the porting. And at that time, Adrian Hartog, who was the, uh, he was in charge of that center. So we work very closely to uh, port the design to CDI. And, uh, and I was, uh, it was very instrumental to, 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 the, to making the first chip. So I, I was very impressed with Adrian. And so uh, I remember one day I came back and talked to Lee. I said, this guy is really good. We should, we should hire him. We should get him on board. So, uh, so uh, and then Lee talked to Adrian and convinced him to quit uh, microelectronics and join us. So, <laughs> so it, it's, it's, it's uh, more than just talking to him. I think I caught it Adrian for about three months. <laughs> Met his met his wife for for I don't know how many times. Uh, it's a long process before he, he's willing to to quit and come and join us. <laughs> did by that time were you paying salaries? I mean, did was that one of his concern is being able to be paid? I think Adrian is also very entrepreneurial. I don't even believe we would pay him that much. And we, we can't afford to pay anybody much money at that time. I think I think also at that time, like the first product that the first chip came back and we call it the graphic solution, the adding part. And I remember Lee and KY went to Las Vegas to uh to uh to the show to announce the product. And I remember we were still working in the middle of the night at, in Toronto and Lee called and said, you cannot believe the line, the people lining up at our tiny Canadian booth, wrap around the building, <laughs> whatever, and trying to get, the, get to find out more about the product. So, so in a sense that like, then Adrian see, also saw that like the risk I guess the risk is not as high as when we first just have a concept. I think you actually see the product and see the demand. And uh, so I, I believe he feel more comfortable at the time. Doing any, doing any kind of custom chip at that time was still a novel risky kind of thing. So it must've been a little scary for you waiting to get the chip back and you were nervous and did the first one work and tell me a little bit about that experience. So it's not just that one, it's like everyone. Every chip coming back, like you almost have a heart attack when you turn on the power and the screen is black. <laughs> <laughs> so this was a very stressful moment. And uh, like in those days, the the worst is that in those days, the design and cycle for the PC is really tight. Like almost every year you have two design and cycles, like the back to school cycle and then the Christmas cycle. So you, the product that you have to do a new product every year and the, 
this year has to be faster, better, cheaper than the last year. So, so you put a lot of, it's a lot of stress in coming out, coming out with new chips and like the, if the chips come back, it doesn't work, need to do a revision is another three months. So, so it's really, um, really nerve wracking to, to make sure the first chip come back work and that you can demonstrate. And you were able to do that with the first chip in this case? Oh yeah. Yeah, the first chip, I believe the first chip work. And, and had and you done any simulation or was it all just hand checking? Well, we, we in those days, like when we first started, like we, we, it's a limited simulation. Like it's not like later on that we can basically write all the software models for, for everything you can think of and actually do the simulation, I mean, 100%. But in those days, you can write some files to exercise it and then look at the output bit and actually scanning. I was like, I remember a lot of nights late night, I just scanning the screen with ones and zero coming down the screen and make sure that there's no funny thing. Uh, so it was, it was uh, almost like working on the, in the machine language at the, at the time. But uh, later on, it's a lot better with all the software modeling. So you plug the first chip in. You 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 had the board ready to go at the time. Yeah. And uh, and then was that right before Comdex that you had to kind of get it going and go to Comdex? Oh, uh, I'm trying to remember what it is. I think it's summertime. Summertime. Yeah. I think some of the time. You started in October. You said you've you the company was established in October, but you'd already done six months of work before then. That's okay. It's not important. I was just curious as to whether there was sometimes there are these panic days when you're working day and night to get something ready for a show. And I was just curious as to whether that was the case in this particular. We, we work day and night for the first few years. Like we, like Lee mentioned earlier, right? Our day starts from maybe nine or 10 till 2 a.m. We go home, sleep, and then come back again. So seven days a week for a few, first few years. So it's, <laughs> It's pretty crazy at the time. So the first year, I understand you did perhaps like ten million dollars worth of business. Is that? Uh... Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think so. I don't ten or twenty. Yeah, it's quite, yeah. It's quite remarkable. Like, I always tell my kids, like, remember the cartoon that when you see a cartoon, the phone ringing and the ring, the phone handle just ringing and then just bounce off the. The whole, like that's what happened when we first announced the product, and the phone just keep on ringing, and, you, and people calling from this big company calling us when with us little, with us like being little known and never been to the Silicon Silicon Valley, <laughs> so we we were pretty amazed by the response. So did you have manufacturing problems? Who is responsible for manufacturing? You've only got a handful of people and all of a sudden you've got to make tens of thousands of boards and chips, right? I think Lee, Lee is handling that, isn't it? Is that your mainly, job? Me, mainly me and KY. I mean, KY background is from the contract manufacturing. So that, that is just a... For me, I think I, I never, because of KY, I never really have to worry about manufacturing problem and stuff like that. So we basically handle all that. So it sounds like the three of you got along quite well, that you each had your own areas of contribution and just worked yep. day and night to make it successful. Yeah, I agree. I think we have a really good team. 
So then we, now you've got one, now you've got one product out there as uh, Benny alluded to, there's, okay, it's always a challenge to then keep up with the, uh, with the market and come out with the next product. So tell me about that. You have a big success on your hands. Now you start panicking and say, what do we do next? It is funny the way that you, you describe it and it's actually, it's actually that way. I mean, the, the life of a graphic solution is actually after, after we have a product is probably one to two years. So even while we're shipping, we, we were worry about uh, what, what next, what, what should be next, what should be next. And, uh, and, uh, and it's like that for us forever that what's the next product, what's the next product. And the next product is uh, our product cycle basically follow uh, IBM uh, product cycle. So the next next computer that they introduced is uh, has a, uh, is it, are they already went to micro channel at that time, EGA or, or still ISA? I forgot. So anyway, I, EGA. EGA, yeah. IBM came up with the EGA card which basically has a higher resolution color mode, uh, ops, basically obsolete the uh, graphic solution. And EGA is also a much more complicated chip. I mean, but by today's standard is, 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 uh, is nothing, but at that time it's a lot more complicated. And it's not discrete, it's, uh, it is based on a custom chip, uh, but it's uh, fairly well documented. And, and so, and another big problem is uh, at that time, there's a company called Chips and Technology. I think about three months after they introduced EGA car is already been cloned by chips and technology and they are selling a chipset, a EGA chipset that anybody can buy to make a EGA graphics card. So, so to us it was a, oh, it's a big problem, right? I mean, how do you, how do you differentiate from, from all these uh, other graphics card company that buy the chip, assemble it and sell Mark up five percent, ten percent, and then sell. So it's, it's always on our mind: you know, what, did, what, what do we do next? What do we do next? How, 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 how do we do, differentiate? So I think that it was Christmas one night, and then Francis, my uncle, said, "Okay, let, let, let's go out and have a good time." So I think we went out to have dinner and then and then while I was dancing with a girl that Francis somehow he, he got he got a girl for me. Um and we were dancing and then I was thinking I was thinking about okay if we can if we can make shades of gray uh, from a black and white monitor. So if we modulate the color, red, green, blue into shades of red, green, blue, so we can, we can make a, we can basically convert a uh, color monitor into a, uh, which only can display 16 color into a uh, color monitor that can display 64 color. So I thought, oh, that's, that's a great idea. That, that basically give us some differentiation. And then I think, I remember I called him and then asked Benny. And he said, oh yeah, of course, we, we can do it. So, so that's, that's how we arrive at the uh, second, second product, which, which sold pretty well, which is called EGA Wonder. 
Um, and then we we also have a a, a a advertising company, which is also a single man company, and they came up with a slogan: "EGA Wonder." Any software, any monitor, any time. I mean, which gives us the differentiation, right? I, I doubt very much that people would use a color monitor interlaced to become a EGA monitor, but it gave us a differentiation, I think. So, good thing you went dancing, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether any, if I remember. Oh, I don't remember the dancing with girl. But <laughs> <laughs> so you went off and designed that, and uh, now were you using Gatorade still, or did you use standard just the standard chips? How did you implement your next? Uh, we've been. Uh, I think that is uh, looking back, like this is one of the mistake. The first mistake we made is we keep on using the Gatorade technology for too long. I think, uh, but yes, to answer your question, yes, we still, uh, that, for that product, we're still using Gary. Yeah. So you used the Gatorade in this uh, EGA Wonder, Wonder product. Uh, that looks like it was a big success for you. Your revenue kept growing very rapidly at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the next thing I noticed there was, uh, so were there other major competition? Did you, were you, you were the leader in this market at that time uh, is for several years, is that correct? Yeah, I believe so. I think, I, I believe when we first started, we did a count, there were about 50 plus graphics card manufacturers at that time. So, so it's a really, uh, very competitive feel and uh, like I always quote like the past uh, CEO of Intel Andy Grove. Mm -hmm. He said that the, only the paranoid will survive. And like Lee said, like we are very paranoid. We <laughs> always read the magazines or whatever one trying to look at what our competitors are doing, what customer want, and what this, what that. We're always trying to find what feature we should put in for the product for us to survive. Now, during the same time, Silicon Graphics was, you know, going after the high end of the graphics business and developing their uh, high end workstation. Did you pay any attention to them or did you get ideas from them to bring down to the PC and did you fear them coming into the PC market? Well, kind of yes and no, because at that time, like the workstations that we've been using, like the Apollo work workstation and the, 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 graphics pro the graphics capabilities like years ahead of what Windows can offer. And, but like, Unfortunately, in those days, I mean, in the early days, the graphics is really dictated by IBM in terms of what EGA is, what VGA is, and, and the software need to be compatible with the IBM standard or re their register sets. So there, there isn't much room for, I mean, to deviate from, from that. Not until IBM come up with the, uh, the uh, 8514 adapter that uses like kind of a acceleration mode that are very much depending on software drivers. Then the drivers become a layer that can shield the hard become like the hardware can become much more independent. So so that's when we, that's after that, we move into to the, really the graphics accelerators, uh, I mean, uh, evolution and, and leave the VGA compatibility behind. Now, I understand in uh, 1989, you helped establish the uh, Visa uh, 
be a video electronic standards association uh, to standardize graphics formats. Is that correct? Yeah, I think we 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 we're part of that effort. To, yeah. uh, at the time, uh, the uh, people starting to want to play video on a computer, they watch uh, movies or whatever on computer. So, so video become another feature that the user like want to want to have besides the the graphics part of it. So you were continuing to grow in Toronto. Uh, you were hiring, by this time you must have been growing very rapidly. You must have been hiring uh, engineers and did you uh, pay a lot of attention to marketing or did you feel that it was uh, the technology that was the driving force here? How, how did you manage that, Lee? I think, uh... There's an advantage of uh, and disadvantage of being in Toronto. Uh, obviously, the advantage is that the cost of living is, is low, much lower than the valley. Uh, people don't move around as much. It, it, it's easier to to attract talent, and once they work here, they, they stay. Um, but the disadvantage is obviously the pool of talent is, is, is uh, much smaller. Um, uh, I just want to go back to uh, uh, Matt Fanny was mentioning about we were too too late in switching away from Gateway. I mean that, that that's the result. That's hardly the result of being in, in Toronto. Uh, the that the talent to do full custom chip or standard cell uh, or, or mixed signal IC is just, is just not there. Um, so I just, uh, just want to go back a little bit with the, uh, so we're happy, with, we're happy with the EGA and then, and then IBM introduced VGA, which is, uh, which is basically uh, no longer a tax space, a graphic ship, everything is graphics. Um, uh, so, so they have a, a RAM DAC, uh, RAM DAC chip, uh, but they still use a uh, crystal for, for as card, right, to, to control the timing. Um, so we're happy being where we, are, where we were without worrying about there's a big black cloud coming in the horizon. So, so one year when, when I was at Comdex show, at the end of the show, I was, I normally would walk every aisle, the whole, whole, whole Comdex, I would walk every aisle just so that I don't miss anyone. So at the end of the last day of the show, I was walking by a tiny little foot. And then there, there, there was a, the, the car, a tiny little car, a VGA car with just one chip. No RAM back, no crystal, just one chip. Not even a clock chip. And then, and then I, 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 I'm not sure whether it's real or not, right? So I go in and, and, I, and ask and then and it would show me demo and then what, what is a real VGA chip, single chip with RAM back and clock chip here. And then I thought, okay, this is this is our, our end. I mean, we, we, we can't compete with that. We, we thought because RAM deck itself is like five bucks per chip, and the clock chip is about dollar fifty. Right there, is already like almost eight dollars in material cost. And then we, we can't compete, right? And we have no capability of doing a, a full custom mixed signal chip. So uh, when we go back and then we say, oh, this is. This is shit for me. We have to develop that capability. So that's that's where that's where we we really started developing that the ability to do full custom chip in house. Uh, to make a long story short, by the time we have our first full custom mixed signal chip, 
I think we were about two years late. So at that time, we were already a public company. So two years late, I'm not sure if it's one or two years late. So I start already crashed once, I think, because of, because of that. So was this company NVIDIA? Is that the company that had this one chip? That company is called Acumos. I still remember till, right. the, end of, till the end of my life, Acumos. <laughs> then a, a year later, they were purchased by, uh, they were acquired by Serious Logic. No, not Serious Logic. Yeah, Service Logic. Yeah. For $60 million. So, wow. $60 million at that time was a, was a lot of money. Yeah, that was big. Big acquisition. Yeah, it was so much money. But I think it was the right acquisition for Serious Logic. They shipped tons of product, tons of product. So, did you ever talk to venture capitalists about investment, or did they come? They must have come looking for you after you had this big uh, ramp up in revenue. I would think that there'd be a lot of people. Oh. Not really. I think we, we never really go and look for capital because I think we were self-sustaining at that time. Um, it's not like today where people, before they do anything, they go and raise money. At that time, we, got, we kind of thought, okay, we, we can manage, so we were just... Uh, the only time we went out and raised money is... Uh, uh, KY know a supply in Taiwan. They have been sell, they have been supplying us uh, PCB, IC sockets, capacitors, and stuff like that. So they uh, they invested. I don't remember. Is it ten million dollars uh, or twenty? I don't remember how many. For for a big chunk of uh, for of ATI, I think they made a really good investment. But that's the only time we raise outside money. Hmm. Uh, so do you remember what Comdex it was that you saw this Acumos chip? What year? Oh, don't remember. It was in uh, Las Vegas. It was in Las Vegas, Acumos, yeah. I don't know who would... Is it before or after you went public? Before or after? Oh, don't even remember. Probably, do you remember, Benny? Yeah. It's before or after? I think after. You went public in November of 93. Oh, I don't know. It would be before then. And then, before? yeah, you had a big, it said that you had a, a loss or you the stock really tanked in August of 94 went from 20 to five or something? That might be around, I think probably either before, maybe around the same time, because I remember we were late with this one integrated single chip solution. And then we were stuck with a lot of inventory, right? When, uh, uh, when, when we were late with the integrated chip and we we're shipping graphics card with the, the graphics chip, a RAM deck, and and cock chip. So our, our stock tank. That was our first tank after we went public. Yeah, I think. So what do you remember about the process of going public? Was everybody was did you all agree that was the thing to do? And uh, did KY take the lead on that, or did you play a role, significant role? How was that? How did that all go? I think we all all like the idea of going public. And uh, KY took the lead. He basically went and meet, meet all the, uh, went on the road show and stuff like that. So he, KY is our front man of ATI. It's a big celebration on the day you went, uh, went public. I think so. Don't remember now. <laughs> Benny, do you remember? <laughs> I think so. Do you remember? I think so. Yeah. Usually that's a big, you know, 
huge party and everybody's drinking champagne and you guys are too busy working. Yeah. Remember, we celebrated. Yeah. <laughs> For most companies. I, mean, I think we should have remembered. Yeah, you would think. Yeah. Um, so anyway. I think it was, a, it was a big IPO by Canadian standard at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, how... how uh, how important was the integration of video and graphics together? Did that become a major opportunity for you? And how did you get into the set-top box business? And that, I'm not sure if I'm putting them in the wrong order, but uh, that it's a very different business than the one you've been pursuing as part of PCs. You want to answer that, Penny? Yeah. I think uh, like, the video it was almost like a natural extension together with the graphics on the graphics part. Like, like I mentioned earlier that people starting to want to play video on their computer. And uh, in those days, we starting to accumulate a lot of uh, customers. And uh, especially customer in the Far East, like in Taiwan, like uh, people are really kind of Playing video is kind of an important feature for the for for the for the market, and uh, so we have a lot of customer feedback on on, on this feature. And, and actually, in general, when we when we started to think about what the product features list should be for the next product, we uh, we started to talk to the customer and starting to talk to also Microsoft. Microsoft has a big part in it because Microsoft, like everything need to have the window to support it. And uh, so we, that's why we also have, a, like we put somebody stationed in Microsoft to actually every year we like, they will have discussion with the Microsoft team and come up with like, this, the spec or the feature list for the next product. And and set -top box, regarding the set-top box, is really a, I mean, as the company become public company, then one of the goal is to expand, the, I mean, increase revenue and, and everything. So, so we look at the set-top box is become another market that we already have the technology to, to do product for that space. And the set-up box business is has a long designing cycle, right? but once it's designed in, it, it stays there for a long time. Like it's not as sensitive as to the PC market that you need to change your graphics card every year and, and have, have to be uh, the best in terms of the benchmark test or whatever. So, so we thought that the, the setup box would be a good business and the volume is good. So that's why we get into that as well. Um, and did you have a, a marketing department that was driving this or was this sort of you, the, the three of you, or how, how did new product decisions get made, especially to enter new markets, strategic decisions to enter new markets. How was that done? I think as the company grew, like the marketing department also grew and, and they, they usually uh, are responsible that the marketing department is tasked with like coming up with the product features and whatever. And then we will have a company, we have meetings to go through it and things like that. So it was no longer Lee going off on the dance floor and coming up with the idea for the next product. I think uh, well, after we move into the graphics accelerator, like, I mean, those type of products, I think 
we we let the marketing do the job. Mm -hmm. So, so, so I, I want to add that uh, I used to uh, when, when we were smaller, I used to think kind of like uh, when when people ask us uh, if we have a marketing department, you know, and I sort of like. Uh, uh, don't say, oh, okay, we don't really have one. And we always uh, always kind of uh, feel subconscious, right, that we don't have a proper marketing department. But when I look back after all these years, uh, it has this advantage and disadvantage. Uh, the, 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 the thing with, uh, I was thinking about, I think in the beginning, we, are, we have the best marketing department of any company because the designer, right? Uh, Benny, Adrian, myself, we were, we were so close to the market. We know, we know everything about the graphics market. What's coming, what's next, who is doing what. So, so if, if I go back to the time when we were smaller, when people ask us to have a marketing department, I don't have to feel ashamed. Oh, we don't have one. Uh, but at that time, I don't know any better, right? And I kind of think that the company that has a dedicated marketing department who, who has the same memo between marketing and engineering, it, it, it's not working. It's not working efficiently. Uh, uh, and we were, as Danny said, we were always paranoid about uh, the, the biggest fear at that time. We were always concerned about Intel integrating graphics chip into the processor or into the core logic. I mean, that, that's keeping us at night all the time. Uh, are we going to be integrated out of business next year? I mean, what, what do we do if Intel do this, if Intel have that? But all those fears, now that you look back, despite Intel being the biggest company in the world, semiconductor company, company in the world with resource beyond our imagination, the fact is good people, talented people are always in limited supply, regardless of whether you're Intel or IBM. And who, where would you put your best people? Is, is I, or Intel, I will put them in the, in the processor because they also have competition. But the processor is making huge margin. And they just have to increase the clock speed from, I think when they started this four megahertz, now they're talking gigahertz. But, Had I, know, had, had I know any better, we don't have to worry, that, worry about Intel that much because I think being big is the biggest impediment to being to innovate. And also they have a bread and butter product, which is going to pull all the talent into the bread and butter product. Uh, so we were, we, were, we were worried all these years for nothing. <laughs> The competition is going to come from somewhere else, not from yep. Intel. <laughs> from smaller companies than from Intel. So speaking of that, you mentioned the fact that not being in Silicon Valley caused you to stay with uh, Gatorades. When did you establish an out, uh, you know, a significant presence in Silicon Valley, and was what was the driving force in doing that, and how did how did that come to be? Actually, we develop our our capability with uh, Snake chip in Toronto. We didn't actually have to go to uh, the valley for that, but that's why we were late because we were, we were developing a fairly difficult competence, right, from from scratch. Uh, so. So we started with hiring somebody from uh, Bell Northern Research, which is the uh, biggest research organization in, in, in uh, Canada. 
So we hire, we hire one person, uh, Roger Colback, to do Mexico chip art. Roger Colback, by the way, was my supervisor when I worked in Michael. Mm -hmm. So at that time, they were working on a switch capacitor filter chip for, for telephone. So the telephone was just started being digitized at that time. So all the analog line going to uh, the central office would be digitized. But before they do that, they need to uh, have a really nice uh, sharp roll off filter that roll off at three kilohertz. And they want to make it into one chip without inductor, without capacitor, one single chip. So they, they were expert in doing that, but, but that gives them the, uh, the technological background to do a clock chip, to do a RAM deck. But it's not direct experience. So, so it took us a while to, to have that capability in house to design a clock chip that doesn't jitter when, when, you, when you display graphics on a monitor and a, and a RAM deck chip that runs at 80 megahertz. Uh, so it was a painful, it was painful, but, but we did it. And I'm glad we did it because uh, with that capability, we were basically self, uh, we're not relying on anybody else uh, for, for, for this uh, a key feature of our, of our product. Mm -hmm. So um, I have a note here, it says you, worked with uh, United Micro Microelectronics, UMC, to develop a semiconductor plant in Taiwan. Is, can you tell me about that? Oh yeah. Uh, the, the semiconductor cycle, so it goes in cycle, right? Every four years you have a shortage and every four years you have an excess. And, and you can tell that from the, the pricing of a RAM chip. Uh, so at the peak of the cycle, you can not buy any RAM, the price would be like triple. And then four years later, uh, you will be dirt chip and, and there will be the RAM chip coming out of the years. So, so we were, we were, at that time, we we're beginning to be a big customer of wafers. And TSMC is, everybody go to TSMC even at that time, 20 years ago. So we, we felt that we, we need to have better relationship with another fab. It so happened that UMC is building a new fab at that time. And they're looking for, for partners uh, to help fund the fab. It's a billion dollar fab. Uh, so they, they're starting so at that time you can buy 5% of the fab. I don't remember how much, 20 million, five, fifty million million, $50 or something like that uh, to guarantee capacity. So that's how we got involved with UMC. And did that work out? I mean, did you, uh, were you able to utilize that capacity and did that helps minimize the disruption in your wafer sourcing? I think, I think we did. We, we had a really good relationship with UMC. Uh, we, we bought a lot of wafers from them. I don't know. I don't remember. I think they are, they are still a pretty big foundry in Taiwan, I think, even today. Hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So uh, in 1997, you acquired Tseng Labs. What was the motivation for that? And what was the key advantage of that? I don't think we acquired Tseng Lab. <laughs> you, you didn't? Oh, no, we didn't acquire Tseng Lab. We acquired Chromatics. I, I think we did. We also acquired Sang Lab. You did? Yeah. And you got an engineering team out of that? Remember Frank Lin or something? I think we acquired that too. At that time, I think they have some type of a 
new rendering technology. I think we did, but I'm not 100% sure. I don't remember. That. I can't kind of vaguely remember we were saying that. It looked like maybe the major advantage was getting 40 engineers uh, from Yeah. There. They're going under, and then basically we acquired a team, mm -hmm. basically. And were they based in Toronto also, or are they somewhere else? No, uh, in, in the Valley. That's, so was that your first major acquisition or position in Silicon Valley? No, I think people, before that, we acquired another company that, that kind of bring us, uh, that brought us a 3D technology. We acquired a company in uh, Boston. Uh, uh, it, it's a Japanese company division. It's called Kabodo. They, they are going to close down. They are going to close down that division. And at that time, we happened to to just starting to focus on uh, 3D. And then there's a team right there, ready to do 3D for a really good price. So that's our first acquisition. And that was in 1995? Don't remember which year, but the team was a really good team. But that team was in Boston, not in Silicon Valley, correct? Oh, yeah, that team is in uh, Boston. So was Sing Labs the first one in Silicon Valley? Yeah. I think so. Um, so while we're talking about uh, acquisitions, the next one looks like came in 2000 when you acquired Artex, the RTX. Yep. Yeah. Maybe Benny, you had left, you said you left in 1999? Yeah. So you were gone by that time. So before we get to that, or Benny, were you running engineering throughout this period? What was your... Um... No, I believe, uh, no, Adrian is running the engineering. Okay. So were you doing natural design work or are you like... No, I, 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 I kind of like liaising, liaising between the engineering and the, the customer in the Far East. Oh, okay. So I, uh, in the early days when we first started, I visit uh, kind of the customer base in the Far East, in Taiwan, mainly in Japan and Korea. So there's a kind of a relationship there. So, um, so I've been uh, go to visit them regularly and talk to them about finding out what they need and, and things like that. So what led to your departure in 1999? What led to the departure? Why did you leave the company? I think I was tired. <laughs> <laughs> 14 years. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, we'll get back to that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so in 2000, you acquired Artex, which also brought in uh, a future CEO, Dave Orton. I presume you were still with the company at that time, Lee? I was in the middle of leaving as, as the deal is being negotiated. Um, I left December... I left just before the year 2000, January year 2000, when, uh, when everybody think the sky is falling down because uh, it's rolling over the, see, from uh, 1999 to oh, 2000. Yeah. The yeah. plane is going to fall out of the sky. Right. The elevator is going to stop running and all that shit. And there's consultant everywhere helping people solve that problem. And the crazy thing is everyone, every, everyone want, a, uh, uh, want to relieve their own diabetes. So they want an indemnity from, from their supplier. So the supplier want indemnity from the supplier. So way down the chain, everyone, when there's nothing to worry about, it becomes a 
a big issue, get discussed in the board meeting and shit like that. It turns out that it's a nothing, uh, which is really should be a nothing. Anyway, but yeah, that's, so Alex still kind of like, uh, so at the time we, me and Benny was always concerned about, okay, uh, shit, I mean, how, how do we protect ourselves from Intel? How do we protect ourselves? And then we were thinking of doing processor. And then later on, we're thinking the best place to integrate a graphic chip maybe is the chipset, not the processor. Uh, so uh, I believe half a year before I left, when uh, this RX opportunity came up, I think I learned. I think I learned also learned about RX from from our fab supplier that said they kind of picked me up and wow, this company really smart. They they have a smart way to uh, prototype the call call logic chip and stuff like that. And uh, and and I think we were in discussion with with RX and then. We even have a code name for that. I forgot what's the code name uh, for this project. But, uh, but I left before RX was formally acquired. So, uh, so both of you had left by the time that uh, that sort of the next major crisis hit when Nvidia appeared and uh, started taking major market share. Did, did you remain on the board of directors at all, or were you completely disconnected from the company? So I was uh, completely disconnected from the company. Actually, and Nvidia appeared on our radar screen way earlier than year 2000. I mean, they we were always neck and neck. I, I hate to admit this, I, but, but I think that hardware we are pretty much even. I think we are neck and neck. The driver, I think they have a better driver team. Uh, so, I don't know. We always uh, leapfrog, we always try to leapfrog each other. And uh, they turn out to be our biggest friend, uh, NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like. There was a period of time in the early 2000s where each one would take the lead from the other uh, every other year or something like that, that there was oh, a yeah. leapfrog. Painful, leapfrog. painful. <laughs> so uh, is there anything more that you would like to say or can say about uh, uh, ATI, given that you'd both left uh, in 1999 or 2000? I think we've covered the important points, but uh, you know, you both put in 14, 15 years of uh, incredible hard work. What are your, uh, what are your reflections? Uh, what are your most memorable uh, thoughts about, about your experience doing that firstly? Okay, maybe I'll, I'll go first. Yeah. I think that uh, at, the, at the time, at the time I left ATI, I thought that one of the main reasons I left is uh, I thought that we were doing all these uh, products mainly for games. Uh, but we're developing, we have thousands of engineers designing 3D accelerator for playing games. I thought, oh, come <laughs> on, uh, what's the point? <clears throat> I mean, it's already beyond, the capability is already beyond what you need to do a run a spreadsheet or, or whatever you need to do uh, with your everyday office work, right? so it's just mainly for games, and, and you have no idea today. Oh, it's also great for AI. It's, it's great for parallel processing. I mean, um, but 
what, what makes me really happy is I think we, we, we build something really enduring. But it's, even 20 years after we left uh, ATI, uh, the, the, the core competence, the, the capability that we build is still useful. So with that, uh, I don't even know what, what AMD, the latest processor, graphics processor from AMD can do, right? But they, they all build on what we, 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 started, we started with. And we have a, a great patent portfolio, which, which by itself is very, is very valuable. I think today, if, if you have a new startup doing graphics chip, uh, not to mention the cost, the, the cost to to, de to design a complex 3D or whatever chips. Uh, the the IP required the, the the patent. You probably will sue. You may be sued by everyone. The existing player or patent violation. You violate this or violate that. So so the patent portfolio in itself is really valuable. That's all I want to say. Yeah, you mentioned uh, the machine learning, the uh, you know artificial intelligence work, and I thought it was in sort of doing the research here. I was struck by the fact that uh, the guy who uh, who really made the breakthrough in using uh, developed machine learning was right there at the University of Toronto, yeah. uh, Jeffrey Hinton. And uh, I thought, boy, you're right there under his nose and <laughs> developing chips that eventually <laughs> would become a critical element in uh, this new machine learning based revolution in AI. Yeah. And I understand a lot of uh, new startup, AI startup, uh, some of them are uh, alumni from ATI. Yeah, I'm uh, actually investigating many of those for for another job that I have. So yeah, there's a yeah. probably a hundred different, literally a hundred different companies starting up trying to do some sort of AI accelerator uh, capability. So Benny, what is your, uh, uh, you said you were tired. What was your, in reflecting back, what are you, <clears throat> what do you take away from your experience at uh, ATI? Well, I think, uh... It was a good run for, for me. And like, like I mentioned earlier, when we first started, like there are about 50 competitors in the graphics arena. And today we are still one of the uh, two people that's still standing. You're a survivor. Yeah, so I, I, I mean, so I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of the team, basically. Mm -hmm. And like I was uh, recently like talking about with the company that uh, uh, in uh, that used to be a ex ATI team in Shanghai, and they uh, they uh, they just uh, announced their first AI processor uh, from that same team. So now, what company is that? I'm interested. <laughs> uh, I don't quite remember the name. That's okay. Maybe you can send it to me later. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So a lot of those, uh, a lot of the technology and architecture that went into the chips you were designing, I'm sure are directly applicable to what's needed to accelerate uh, machine yeah, it's, learning. It's kind of uh, like build, it's, it has a foundation and then it build on top of it. And like, although like I share Lee's point of view, I mean, sentiment that uh, when we, at the time, like in 1999, before I left, like we were like doing the three graphics 3D acceleration and every year, like, like next year's product need to do how many, like tens of thousands of polygons and and, uh, and so so it become kind of boring to me because it's just every year new product will be you do more polygons you do more layer of uh, shading and whatever but but then I don't really see 
anything interesting from it. Mm -hmm. Nothing really new. Yeah, and like not until like later that then the parallel feature, parallel parallel architecture of the graphics processor become a kind of a, 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 an architecture that can be used for the AI processing. Mm -hmm. so, so, and sometimes I wonder why the guy you mentioned is from U of T and he's just starting to work for NVIDIA and not not ATI, but yeah. um, but going back, right? Uh, there are two like two things that really, I mean, give me joy is that one time when we were doing the early days, we one of the product is called Graphics Ultra. Mm -hmm. It's based on the eighty five fourteen architecture, and uh, one day I was going to this visit customer in the U S. I was going through the U S. custom. And the officer asked me, uh, what company you work for? I said, ATI. And, is, he, and then he said, oh, Graphics Ultra. And I was like, oh. <laughs> 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 I know how proud of that. <laughs> I was kind of, kind of happy to know that. And then, then another instance was I, I was uh, touring a small, small island somewhere in the uh, thing in the Mediterranean and then I went to this went through the window of a computer shop and I see our product there and so I said wow it's good that when you design something and then you actually see that product is actually being displayed and sell and available for sale is, is, is some uh, nice feeling yeah people are buying your product that's uh, always a great uh... Great reward. So I'm going to ask both of you, I'll start with you, Benny, since uh, we're uh, talking now is, okay, you sort of got, you got bored, you, you know, lost uh, the, the excitement of doing new things. Have you been involved with other technology activities since then, in the last 20 years? Uh, what's been your uh, work since then? And what do you, uh, what advice would you give to somebody going into the technology business today? Well, I've been, uh, since then I've been like <clears throat> doing investing, kind mm -hmm. of a venture investing into like new startup and things like that. What areas particularly interest you? And mostly uh, in the high tech space and some are in the biotech. And uh, I'm amazed that still a lot of great ideas that people can come up with. So, um, and, and, and I mean, to the, to, the, to the newcomer, I think that, I mean, a lot of opportunity is still available. So, so just stop dream, start dreaming and like about how you can make things better. And there's, I think there's still a lot of opportunities. Is there any particular area that you're most excited about in biotech or what, you know, is, is there a particular company that you think is just, just uh, really outstanding? Well, there is a company that they are, they are currently under the radar that I'm not announced. I'm not, I mean, authorized to, to disclose and, and like they are working on some revolutionary treatments for diabetes, diabetes, mm -hmm. and uh, so I'm I'm quite excited about that when they when they announce. That's great. Finding uh, meaningful things continuing. Uh, Lee, what about you? You've been in the venture capital business. What tell me about your uh, your interests and activities since uh, leaving in 2000? No, not really much. Um, the thing is, uh, I'm, a, I'm a very lazy person. <laughs> I'm not forced to do anything. I tend to not, not do anything. Um, today, I'm, my focus is my granddaughter. 
and uh, nothing makes me happy or sad too much. The things that relate to me directly, right? But I mean, what would make me really excited or happy would be would be my my son uh, and a big break on on whatever or my granddaughter or my daughter. Uh, I haven't, I've, most of my investment are passive. I don't even like investing, but uh, I kind of, uh, through a friend, I, I was involved with, uh, there's a, an incubator at the uh, U of T, uh, uh, Creative Destruction Lab. So, so the, uh, the founder of that lab, uh, Professor RJ, when he founded that lab, he, he kind of uh, convinced me to, to, to be one of the advisor. And I was uh, the advisor there for about two, three years. And, and, and I'm not sure whether people in Silicon Valley know about that or not, but uh, it, became, it became a really successful program. Nowadays, they have chapters uh, across Canada, and I think that they kind of a feeder fund to the uh, to the Y Combinator, uh, Y Combin Y Combinator in the Silicon Valley. Right, right. In terms of advice to the to to the young young guys, uh, I kind of uh, look back. Uh, compare my days to, to, to the current situation where during my days when we got started, uh, there's no internet, the information available is, is, is far less than, than uh, what, is, uh, what it is available today. And there are all kinds of advisors, right? Uh, people will advise you on, on capital structure, setting up fund, advise you about your idea, advise you about, you know, about this, about that, mark sales, marketing, whether you're going to win or lose. I think the pendulum swing to the opposite extreme. There's too much advices. Uh, uh, I believe uh, at some point, the young guys uh, just, okay, I've listened to you in a lot of advice, I'm going to jump. <laughs> and don't listen to advice anymore because if, if you listen, if you analyze, I mean, it's not going to be successful, your venture. If you look at the statistics, it's hopeless. Why would you even start a company? Why would anybody bet on, bet on, bet on starting a company when their odds of being successful is so low? There's no reason to start. So, so my, my advice is just analyze, but don't overanalyze. Don't overanalyze and just, just jump. And also the, the, the difference between people with experience and no experience is confidence. I truly believe you want to be successful, you have to have the confidence. You cannot, and trying to get, get advice here, whenever you run into a problem, it actually reduces your confidence because confidence comes from making mistakes and be able to fall down and come back up, persevere. So that's my advice to the, the young guys. Well, that's a great perspective. Uh, I don't want to leave without acknowledging, uh, it looks like you've also made some major contributions to uh, philanthropic contributions to the University of Toronto and also to some local hospitals. Um, looks like you have some, can you tell us a little bit about that and your motivations? Yeah, like, uh, as I said, my, I came here with a blank sheet of paper. And even though I'm not, I'm not even, you know, I only see dust of a Bill Gates, or not even see the dust of Bill Gates, but I'm pretty happy where I, where I am. Uh, I learned everything 
I know in technology from U of T. So it's just want to give back. That's great. Um, well, from either of you, is there any uh, final words you want to uh, say about uh, yourselves or the company, or if we think you've, or do you believe we've covered it? Benny, any other thoughts? No, it's, just, it's been a good run for me. Yeah. Well, as you say, it's been a uh, tremendous success to have built a company, uh, fended off so many competitors and uh, built a uh, organization that continues to make contributions, huge contributions to the technology and uh, worldwide industry. So congratulations to both of you. I think uh, you've made a big contribution and appreciate your taking the time this afternoon and uh, hope you found it valuable and learned a few things about each other as well. <laughs>